In this lecture, I'll be talking about how to do a word study. I'll introduce some common resources and that you will be using and maybe some modern examples and tidbits as to how to go about doing a word study. I think this is critically important because still to this day, one thing I do in my personal studies when I prepare Bible studies and sermons is word studies. These are something I do all the time. And I also hear a lot of pastors and Bible study leaders do a semi word study all the time. But at the same time, this is one thing that many pastors make a mistake. In fact, a lot of word studies are very poorly done. So knowing how to do this well is critically important for proper exegesis. One way to do a word study is by looking up a certain Hebrew term in what we call a lexicon. Lexicon is a fancy way to call dictionary or a dictionary in a foreign language. Here are some standard lexica that you'll be using or seeing. The first one I would like to introduce is Brown Driver Briggs or the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew and English Lexicon, commonly abbreviated as BDB. This one's an OD and it's a classic and in fact you can find this resource free online. It is a very good resource. It's one volume and the entries are, sh are short and uh, straight to the point. The number one lexicon that if you had to use money and should buy is probably the Hebrew Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, what is commonly abbreviated as Halot. This originally was five volumes, but now you can buy a two volume set and then you can often buy this lexicon as an add-on on your Bible software, whether that be Accordance or Logos Bible software. This one, it has all the Hebrew and Aramaic terms in the Bible. It talks about cognate languages, that is languages that have similar expressions in maybe, let's say, Phoenician or Philistine, Ugaritic or other Semitic language like Akkadian. There are a couple other more robust options. The first one is the Dictionary of Classical Hebrew. This one has eight volumes, a very expensive um, series. And the other volume is the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, frequently abbreviated as TDOT. Here you're going to have thorough entries um, of each word of the Old Testament. And this one will, will have all the information that you will need about the different nuances that each term has. However, I understand that being 17 volumes, this is a difficult one to have access to unless you live near a theological library. Doing a word study, however, is more than simply looking up a word in a dictionary. In fact, when you're doing a word search, one of the most important thing is to look up every occurrences when a certain term phrase or idea occurs. You can do this by owning a concordance. The most standard academic and Hebrew concordance is the one done by Evan Shoshan. However, this one is in Hebrew, so it's usually inaccessible for students of, of English speakers. Other concordances that are more accessible are these two. One is the new concordance of the Old Testament, edited by Evan Shoshan, and even the Zondervan Hebrew-English Concordance of the Old Testament. These both are easy to use and it will give you all the information you need as to when a certain term occurs and where you can find these references. While owning physical copies of dictionaries or lexicon and concordances are very helpful, I think the future of word studies is using electronic resources. Of course, you can buy really good Bible programs such as Logos Bible Software, which I own, and Accordance, which is frequently popular with Mac users. But for most of my years as a student at a Bible school, through seminary, and even most of my PhD, I actually use free resources and free websites. So I would like to introduce to you one such website and kind of walk you through how I did word studies. These are free, so they don't have fancy ways that and um, uh, fancy applications that maybe save you time and be more precise. But it was good enough for me for almost all of my um, studies, and I still use them very frequently. 
So one website is the Blue Letter Bible. This is a wonderful website that allows you to look up various translations um, in um, different English versions as well as in original languages. The first thing you want to do is find a biblical text in Hebrew. In the drop down menu, you can actually pick various Bible translations. Of course, these can be in English, but you can also find various other languages. For those who want to look things in Hebrew, you want to make sure to click the WLC. This stands for the Westminster Leningrad Codex, which is the Masoretic Text Manuscript that is becomes the foundation for the BHS or BHQ and most English versions. Of course, if you're dealing with a textual critical issue and you wanted to see what the Septuagint says, you can also do that by clicking the LXX here. Once you selected the Westminster Leningrad Codex and you're ready to look up a Hebrew a text in Hebrew, just type in the search engine a Bible passage and then click enter and it should take you to that Bible te biblical text. Here you see once it redirects you to the passage, you can see that it's you're going to be able to read each verse in its Hebrew. However, for those who would like a little bit more help when reading the biblical text, one thing you can do is click on the reference and it will give you an expanded page. The expanded page will look something like this. It will give you each Hebrew word and what it is translated in the English. You can also see the transliteration. So for those who can't read maybe a Hebrew text well, can find out how to properly pronounce these words. And you can also find a strong reference number. When you find a word or an expression that you would like to search more, this is where you will click. For example, when reading the book of Genesis, chapter 2, you read that he rested on the seventh day. This raises the question, what does it mean that God rested? Was God tired? Well, in order to find the answer, this is a prime opportunity to do a word search. When you click the reference number, it redirects you to another page. Here, you can find the basic lexical information. You can find out what the term is, um, if it's a verb, if it's a noun, if it's an adjective, what kind of root does the word come from, and also you can find the various ways English translations translate these terms. Based on this, you can find out that the most common way or common meaning of the term Shabbat, the verb Shabbat, is to cease. When you scroll down on that page, you actually come to a concordance. That is, you find out that the total times this word occurs throughout the Hebrew Bible and how many verses it appears in. In a drop-down menu, you can find all the references. Here, you're, you're going to see all 67 verses and 71 times when that certain Hebrew term occurs. While reading all the occurrences of a certain Hebrew term is helpful, especially if you want to get a wider idea of how that certain term means or functions, at the same time, in this specific instance, we are concerned with what does it mean that God rests. In other words, you want to find out instances or verses when Elohim is the subject. Here, we're moving beyond a simple word search and doing maybe a concept search. Here we're going to find out uh, um, specifically what does it mean that God is resting, not anything else or anyone else. To do this, my advice is to use a search function. Any computer should be able to do this. If you're a PC, you can hit the control F and this will give you the search bar that pops up. For Mac users, usually command F. Make sure that you have downloaded Hebrew font or you have allowed um, the Hebrew font to be typed on your computer. Most computers have that option today. And you want to type in the certain term that you're looking here. For my case, I am looking for Elohim. And you're going to scroll through and read through the verses specifically when Elohim is mentioned in association or in the same verse as Shabbat. By doing this, I found out that there's actually only three instances, three verses, when specifically the Hebrew Bible says that Elohim, God, rested, or God, Shabbat. Another important thing to think, however, at this moment, is that 
we're doing a conceptual study. What does it mean for this divine being to rest? Another helpful thing to find out is also this cognate idea or similar idea when Yahweh, the tetragrammaton, rests, when Yahweh is the subject. In order to do this, you can do another search. Now, instead of searching the term Elohim in association with Shabbat, you can just type in Yahweh, the yod He vav He, and you find out that Yahweh serves as a subject of Shabbat in seven verses. In addition to doing a conceptual study, it also is critical that you go beyond a word study by doing phraseology studies because there are many phrases or construct phrases that occurs in Hebrew that these two words or three words are meant to be taken as one. Another term or literary technique that's used by the, the authors of the Hebrew Bible is something called hendiasis, when there are two, maybe noun or verb, or just basically two terms put together with a vav, and this is, instead of saying um, two concepts, it's actually expressing one idea, one unified idea through two words. When these things happen, when there's a concert phrase or a phrase in hendiasis, you want to make sure that you study both terms as one. You're looking for a specific phrase instead of just individually studying words. One example of maybe a phraseology study is studying what the term or expression, the phrase Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God means. If you open up Genesis chapter 1 and you read the text, it says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. What is this Spirit of God? Well, let's start a word, word search or phrase search. First of all, pick a term here and let's find out when that term occurs. When you look up at the meaning of Ruach, you actually find out that the, this term has a wide semantic domain. It can mean wind, it can mean breath, it can mean mind, and even spirit. So the question becomes, in Genesis 1, is it the wind of God? Is it the breath of God? Or is it the spirit of God? This is a very important question, especially, for example, when you're engaging with the Jehovah's Witness. Did you know that the Je Jehovah's Witness denies the Trinity? Therefore, they do not see the Spirit of God as a part, a divine person. Therefore, they will consistently translate this expression, Ruach Elohim, as God's invisible force. Well, is that what it means based on the Hebrew? Let's look it up. When you go to the concordance, you actually find out that Ruach appears a staggering 378 times. Yes, I understand that will take a long time for you to go and read through each occurrence of the term Ruach. However, in this instance, we're not simply doing a study on the word Ruach, but we're looking at what does Ruach Elohim mean? The Spirit of God. For, in, for this case, you want to do the search function again and specifically look for this phrase, Ruach Elohim. Even though that there are over 300 verses where this appears, you actually find out that you can quickly narrow down the occurrences of this specific phrase. Then you want to tabulate or compile all the occurrences of this specific expression. The term Ruach Elohim, or this expression or phrase, appears only in 12 verses in the Old Testament. They appear a number of times in the Pentateuch and the historical books, but strangely enough, it appears only once in the prophetic corpus in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 11. Then you want to talk about how these Ruach Elohim, these occurrences, happen. Is there some commonalities between them? Well, we actually do see this. The first time, of course, in Genesis, uh, Genesis is when the Spirit of God hover over, hovers over the face of the waters. But then we find out that when the Spirit of God appears, it is almost always in association with people. We read that the Spirit of God is in or fills a person. We also see that the Spirit of God comes on a people to prophesy. And then the Spirit of God gives a vision to Ezekiel in this one unique occurrence in the prophetic corpus. From this phrase search of this formula, Ruach Elohim, we already start seeing a pattern. That is, when the Ruach Elohim occurs, it's almost always in association, in connection with people. 
that there is an intimate connection between Ruach Elohim and people. And not only that, that the Ruach Elohim indwells and comes upon and empowers people to do magnificent things. For example, Joseph is uh, able to interpret dreams and is described as one who is wise. Bezalel is, has a spirit of God in which enables him to do magnificent work for, in preparation of the tabernacle. The spirit of God comes upon various people and makes them prophesy, speak divine words. And, of course, the Spirit of God can come even upon or move upon a prophet, this time Ezekiel, to give visions. In light of this, the occurrence of Genesis 1 is truly unique because this is the only time when the Spirit of God appears without a human being. And, of course, this is unsurprising given the literary context in which there is no humans on the earth at this point yet. When you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, closer, when it talks about the Spirit of God, Ruach Elohim, hovering over the face of the waters, you also notice one thing that might be interesting, that me rachethet. What does that mean? It probably sounds unfamiliar to you because it did uh, um, sound unfamiliar for me because this is quite rare. It's a very rare term in the Old Testament. In fact, we only see this term, verb appear three times in the entire Old Testament. This is, um, it comes from the verb rachath, and it seems to have this connotation of hovering over, especially in the peel form. We see this in Genesis 1, 2, and in Deuteronomy 32, verse 11, we see an especially important reference of like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young. So the idea of hovering over is connected with the imagery of the eagle, especially for rare words. In fact, there are terms called hapax legomena, it's a fancy way to say this word only occurs once in the entire Old Testament. In fact, there are thousands of hapaxes in the Old Testament. The only way to find out the meaning of a rare term is really to look at other Semitic languages, other maybe distant relatives to Hebrew. Maybe that be Aramaic, Ugaritic, or Assyrian. I'm sure you're saying, well, Kaz, I don't know these other languages quite yet. Well, don't worry, because there are resources that have compiled these terms and compare these terms are ready for you. Of course, looking at Halot, the Hebrew Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, would be a starting point. However, for those interested in doing a little bit more detail work of comparative Semitics, that is comparing maybe words, grammar, and other forms of Semitic languages, this you can actually go to lexicon that are specifically um, specialized in finding or comparing specific Hebrew terms with other Semitic languages. For example, here I show you the Dictionary of Northwest Semitic Inscription and a Dictionary of um, Ugaritic. And you find out that both dictionaries will indicate that this term, rachath, means to brood over, to hover over, and most often these term appears in correlation or connection with an imagery of an eagle. Based on what we've seen, we already see that the Spirit of God doesn't seem to be some impersonal force because the Spirit of God is almost always in association with people and enables people to do certain things. So I think that there's a personal aspect with this. And in Genesis 1, before the creation of the world, the language and visual imagery used to the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, is specifically a term that refers to living organisms, that it uh, talks about how a uh, ego um, hovers over. So the imagery applied here is something of, uh, inanim uh, uh, of an animate object than an inanimate object. 